I played a recent Capture the Flag challenge all about Windows forensics and digging out data out of the clipboard, what you copy and paste when you're using your computer, and I thought it was kind of cool, a little bit of, hey, digital forensics, incident response, stuff that you might do in the real world, more than just, hey, some cheeky, I don't know, strings on a file. So I want to showcase it in this video, get you a little bit in the know on the research, and we'll have some fun. Let's go. Now, I typically play Capture the Flag challenges inside of a Kali Linux virtual machine to do offensive red team hacker stuff, but in this case, hey, it's probably a little bit more instant response, so I am inside of Remnux, the reverse engineering malware Linux distribution. I thought I could showcase this in SIFT, one of the SANS incidents or er, SANS Institute forensics toolkit thing. Uh, but I got that virtual machine started and then didn't see everything that I wanted to. So if you haven't used SIFT, it's worth a try. But in this case, I'm in Remnux. So I've got the capture the flag board up in my web browser. This is from TechSaw 2023. And in the forensics category, the challenge was called Ghost in the Clipboard for 250 points. It says a hacker has broken into your computer and stolen one of your passwords. You were able to extract the app data folder as it was right after the attack took place. See if you can find out which password, the flag that they stole, so you can change it before any damage is done. And they give us this app data zip file to download. Now, if you aren't familiar, the app data folder or directory is one of those usually hidden and tucked away folders and directories inside of your user profile on a Windows computer. Say if you're using Windows, hey, you likely have under your username, John, a hidden directory called app data. It's actually set as an environment variable. And if I actually uh, broke out of the virtual machine and were working on my Windows host, if you were to open up the file explorer, you would be able to take a look at this. I'm going to open it up in the run dialog box for the Windows key and R. And know that I type in app data between two parentheses, and this will actually bring you to the app data directory. Take a look. Hey, we have a couple different folders in here for local, local low, and roaming. Those get into some finer details that I won't drive down right now, um, but that does showcase some of the interesting and cool stuff that's kind of pertinent to application data hence the name. Anyway, let's go ahead and download this directory, download this zip archive, and let's create a directory for it. I'm going to open up a terminal here. I'll zoom in and full screen this. Let me make a directory for ghost in the clipboard. I'll change directory into that, and I'll move from the downloads, which I think we'll actually go ahead and put it, yeah, in the home directory, in this current directory, and there it is. Now I can go ahead and unzip this app data folder, and there's a lot of stuff to it because it's all those files and folders that you just saw as you would see them on Windows. Now, thankfully, all the puzzle pieces that have been given in the challenge prompt, this challenge description, and the download kind of narrow the scope and saying, okay, you're probably going to end up finding the clipboard data within this app data directory and all the files that have been given to you. So that at least clues us in on what we might be able to do for research if you've never done this before. In this case, I hadn't. So I'd ask Uncle Google and see what I could track down. I did find as one of the results, hey, this Windows 10 forum, maybe a bulletin board where the question was asked in general support, where is the data stored for for the new clipboard. In modern versions of Windows operating systems, hey, I'm rocking Windows 10, uh, Enterprise 18.09, whatever, whatever. Some fellow responds, Daz 10, so kudos to him. Their C users, username, app data, local, Microsoft Windows, clipboard, pinned. Uh, well, let's go see if that thing exists for one thing. Uh, let me move back over to my terminal and let's see inside of this current directory, we have the app data folder that we just extracted and then the local, local low and roaming all things here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change directory into that big path that we saw and copied and pasted out of that forum here. But note, hey, we won't be able to actually get to this location because using the backslashes in the Linux path, like the Linux command line, it's going to think that's an escape character, an escape sequence. We'll need to go ahead and actually CD. I'll bring that to another line so that's a little bit more readable again. And change it so it's not proceeding with a backslash, because that would bring us to the root of the file system if it were a forward slash, as it should be in Linux. And let's just change all of these backslashes to forward slashes. I don't think that's too hard to do with just some sort of manual, hey, copy and paste, remove. Uh, and let's see if we can get into this directory. And we can. So there are a couple entries in here, but before I dive deep down into the pinned section, I'm curious what else might be present inside of this clipboard directory. Well, you can see, hey, I do have uh, a long line here in my prompt, but there is history data and there are pinned folders. So let's see what is in this history data. There's this thing, looks like a CLS ID or GUID, uh, class ID or one of those generic unique identifiers. We could try to change directory into that. I'll hit tab to autocomplete it. And there's nothing in there. Like if I LS tag LA, there are no files in the current directory. So that's not really helpful. Uh, let's move back around and see if we can get back into the 
pinned directory, as the uh, forum post suggested we could go to. Inside of this directory, you have yet another CLS ID GUID thing. We can hop into that, we can ls, and there's this metadata.json file, which is interesting. Might open that up in a Sublime Text text editor. And this is it, it is JSON, right? The JavaScript object notation. Uh, I should go ahead and install a package to format that JSON. Can I do that? I think it's called pretty JSON. Yeah, okay, installed that. Now I can format that and that's a little bit more readable. Okay, so we have items given that CLS ID or GUID, whatever you wanna end up referring to this as, and the source as to what it might be, the timestamp as to when it was tracking it down, and a cloud ID. Things that I don't exactly know about and understand right now, but there are at least still some more things we could explore because inside of this, there is also that other directory for that GUID. Let me CD into that. Let's get a awful big long prompt here where this is super hard to read. Maybe we could just change this uh, PS1 to be the dollar sign space. How about that? Okay, so now we have another metadata.json. We have a TG9JYXL and a VG4DA equals equals. Uh, interesting to me because those look like base64 encodings of literally just a file name. Uh, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and grab that syntax and just bring that into base64 to decode it. And that says locale. Uh, this other one says, what is it? We'll paste that in. That's text. Peculiar. Okay. Um, but let's go see what else is in here. Cause we have more metadata.json and this tells us, Hey, okay, we actually have something's concluded in the locale, a data stream as being the type here, collection type is encrypted equals true and text is encrypted equals true. Well, we just saw text and locale being the things that we could see but empty properties, nothing else in there to really drill down into. But if these things are encrypted, as it's kind of alluding to, can I actually get anything out of them? Let me cat that TG9, whatever. Uh, okay, bat cat is not letting that happen. Uh, yeah, let's do cat tag A to spit that all out. And it is, of course, binary data. There's not a whole lot we can pull out of that. Unfortunately, we could try to run strings on these things, but that's not gonna work well for us either. There's nothing useful in here, user zero, local. So that's kind of uh, where we're at, but let's go back to some research. Let's go figure out what more we might have available to us. In this resource, this blog post I found from Phil Moore, uh, talking about clipboard history, not Clippy, the cheesy little, I don't know, uh, animated assistant in Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office documents, but they drill down into what they might be able to uncover for clipboard history. They use this exact folder that we were just in, and it notes, hey, you have the same history data and pin folders that we just saw. They all have a GUID, and pinned is an easier test, apparently. They weren't able to get anything out of history data like I was, but they're seeing the exact same thing that we were just seeing. The same metadata.json, the same sources that might be present, and locale text bitmap. I'm assuming that's probably coming from, I don't know, images that it might have copy and pasted. And then it seems like they take a different approach. They start to use some magnet memory process capture stuff. Uh, it looks like they have something for the volatility plugin that they were discussing, but uh, they note here, it because sometimes Sometimes it is encrypted and someone else has done some further research that we could drill down and explore if we wanted to. The NERSOF data protection decryptor tool could try to decrypt it, but uh, I don't know if that will work for us because apparently the data is encrypted with the newer version of DPAPI, DPAPING, that Windows and Microsoft have done some talk about. But uh, some other comments on this note, hey, Windows 10 and 11 use this next generation cryptography API to protect it. Sometimes the user or owner logon password is not required at all to decrypt it. And they have some tool that we could use for this. This password recovery software looks like a Windows utility. And I thought, ooh, okay, maybe that would be kind of cool. It seems like it can extract some of the username, passwords, admin stuff that could be present potentially in a clipboard. And they talk about how that's in there. But if I actually tried to go use this software, it costs money and that's dumb and that's stupid. It shouldn't because people have already solved the challenge and they probably didn't pay $45 for that. So we went down one road, we fall down one rabbit hole, and I don't know if that's going to be the most success there, but it's a little bit interesting and curious, hey, what is going to be inside of those encrypted blobs? If anyone knows in the comments, please do let me know if there's some other tools or tradecraft or things we could use to actually track that down. I'm all ears. Please let me know. So before we go down the next road, if I could, please let me out a little bit of time for today's sponsor. Hey, take it away, sneak. I'll be honest. I write bad code. 
Even though I try to hunt for vulnerabilities in lots of other software, I still have vulnerabilities even in my own projects. Everyone does. And that's why I use Sneak to scan for vulnerabilities in code, dependencies, containers, and configuration files. And Sneak helps find and fix those vulnerabilities in real time. You can try it and see for yourself. You can sign up for free with my link below. Import your repositories and sit back and let Sneak do the work for you. It'll find the flaws and vulnerabilities in your own applications. Check out this prototype pollution vulnerability that Sneak uncovered. We can see more details about the code path that introduced this vulnerability and even learn more about this kind of vulnerability or any others if you check out the Sneak Learn Lesson. I've referenced the Sneak Learn Lessons and their vulnerability database a ton especially in assessments and penetration testing, and even during capture the flag competitions. From there, you can see an explanation of the flaw, proof of concept exploit code and attack demonstrations, and most importantly, how to mitigate this vulnerability. But the best part? Sneak helps you fix this vulnerability with a single click. It'll automatically open a pull request so you can just merge and move on. So seriously, check out Sneak. It's crazy how many vulnerabilities could be affecting your projects and you don't even realize. Take advantage of their resources and learning material and learn all about the different vulnerabilities out there. It's completely free and you can sign up right now with my link in the video description. Huge thanks to Sneak for sponsoring this video. So at this point, we can get back to some more research, some more Googling. And I found this article, this write-up, this blog post from Inverse Echoes, or Lena Lau, incredible, puts out fantastic and phenomenal work, a whole lot of research, a whole lot of stuff that could be helping with forensic investigations. And she has exactly an article on how to perform clipboard forensics. And this gives us a new location to work with, activitiescache.db, and you could be using memory forensics and volatility, just as that other article alluded to. Talking about, hey, you know, threat actors oftentimes copy and paste data to the clipboard. Board, but it's not normal or at least uncommon for us or forensic analysts to dig into it. But there are some really interesting things that could come from it. And I figured, look, this is perfect. This is really worthwhile us digging into because it sounds like this could include some information that we haven't seen yet. They're mentioning this activities cache.db and that has started to log clipboard activity since Windows 10. We don't exactly know what operating system and what version of Windows that we're up against right now. I hadn't checked that out with an app data, and I'm not sure if there's a way to track that down. Again, please let me know in the comments if you happen to know. But we could see if actually the files that are pertinent for this activities cache.db are present because thankfully they fall into app data. So we can move into local connected devices and then a user platform or user profile. Again, we have some backslashes here. So let me move out of the current directory that we're in. We're going to have to go a ways back up. <laughs> Where are we at now? Okay, cool. Perfect. We landed right in the spot that we were hoping to. Let me change directory and get all of these forward slashes put in place. And now you can see, hey, we have some interesting stuff. There is probably a user profile identifier here. So we can move into that 4F directory and take a look. We have an activities cache.db file. So this should be everything that we need. Let's go see what we could go ahead and do to work with this. When you look up that database in your database browser, it is genuinely just a database like SQLite. We could take a look at some of the specific tables or columns or data present in there. Looks like there are some pertinent things like the start time when the data was first copied to the clipboard, when the data will be deleted from the activities cache, when usually 12 hours, uh, base 64 encoded string of the clipboard contents in the clipboard payload column. That is super duper helpful. Payload could tell us where this came from, the activity type, whether or not it was pasted or not. So this is everything that we need. We just need to fire it up inside of a database browser. I can use SQLite, the SQLite browser, which I don't currently have installed in Remnux. I'm a little surprised that's not already part of it, but maybe Sift had it. I don't know. I don't think it did when I looked at it. So let's go ahead and download that. Now that that's done, we can use our SQLite browser on our activities cache.db file and it fires itself right up. Okay. So now in SQLite browser, we'll want to tap open to this browse data tab and take a look. There's a lot here in this horizontal scroll bar. Oh goodness, I'm sorry, we're in the wrong table. And that is worthwhile noting. Uh, the table tab over here, a little drop down. We can go into the activity operation section as it referred to. And now we have that start time and end time and all the things that they were just celesting in the article. Let me see, can we find the clipboard payload tab? We can here, perfect. And this gives us 
like JSON data for everything that we might be interested in that was stored within the clipboard. I'm gonna go ahead and copy these values and I'm gonna get back into a sublime text text editor so that I could work with all this. All of these things are a little bit interesting here because look, there's base64 data that we could just grab. I do wanna go ahead and extract this though. So what I'm gonna do is uh, select everything with control shift A, I think that's it. Oh, control A, I'm dumb. <laughs> and then uh, control shift L will give us multiple cursors within Sublime Text. So with that, I can hit the home key and then start to move my arrow keys while holding down shift to get to the very, very start of the base 64 payload I want to extract. Then I can hit end a couple times to make sure I'm at the very, very end of uh, the lines for each of them. And I'll go ahead and move my arrow keys back while holding shift to carve out the rest and only retrieve the base 64 data that I want in here. Now, what I could do is I could just simply call this, I don't know, way, way up in whatever directory we started in, ghost in the clipboard. We can call it data.b64 and I'll get back to my terminal where I can now close out a SQLite browser, move back into the ghost in the clipboard directory. And there's our data.b64. 64. Let's go ahead and cat that out. And these are all the B64 entries that we just saw that we extracted out of the activities cache. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cat that out and I'm going to use a while loop as I read through every single line. I could echo out the line and work with it inside of a little bit of a loop here. I will need to specify do to start an inline while loop and then done to denote the end of it. So inside of this little logic branch in the loop here, we could try to base64, tack D, the line. Uh, you'd probably echo and pipe it into base64, tack D, uh, but if you want to do it uh, in a different sort of order, you could actually use the three redirection signs to read it in from some info that you pass in the command line. Let's see if this works. And it seems like it does. Uh, a little bit tough to read. Let me see if I can add another echo underneath each of these. And perfect. Now we're getting some interesting data here. This is our flag. Tech saw this is the flag. And we see that copied a uh, whole lot of times. A couple different entries inside of the activities cache DB file. So hey, there are a ton of tools to actually parse and go through the activities cache.db file. It is just a SQLite browser. So you can kind of navigate and work through it manually as we just did in this video. But there are tons of sweet things to be able to pull apart different pieces and different aspects to it. And there's a whole lot more in that activities cache that would be super duper useful for forensic intel. Uh, I just wanted to put it on your radar in case you haven't seen it before. And I thought this was a super sweet challenge to have more of a practical real world application for some of the forensic works that we might do. Thanks so much for watching this video. Hope you had some fun. Hope you learned something new. Uh, I thought, you know, this is a tool to add to my toolkit and worthwhile to look at the activities cache whenever we can. Please do check out our sponsor. Sneak is all about capture the flag and a whole lot of great stuff just like this, getting learning education out there. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.